We're solely focused on building LifeBridge and, and hiring Steve. Now that Steve is hired and things are in motion, uh, we need to be updating you where are things at with the church plant, what's the plan, what's the strategy, all that sort of stuff. And so we're going to be sending out a letter uh, this coming week, but we'll follow that up with a, a meeting at another time. Uh, uh, partners mean just all about the church plant and that sort of thing. So just want you to be aware of that. Um, other than that, uh, news is uh, Monica had her little baby at uh, 5 o'clock this morning. Um, eight pounds, what, six ounces was yeah. it or something like that? And uh, so anyways, uh, they're both going to be remaining in the hospital just for a few days. And so just uh, Shelly wanted to make sure that that information was communicated to you. Um, as we go into August, um, I really want to be, you to be praying about and thinking through who can you be connecting to God? Uh, in our community group, we are talking about being more strategic in our mission. In the same sense that Paul strategized what cities and what towns he's going to. And once he got into the towns, where would he go? Would he go down by the river where they're praying? Would he go to the synagogues? Would he go to the marketplace? He strategized his mission. And, uh, and what we're saying is, well, we need to be doing the same. So our group is actually supposed to be strategizing what is, what is their missional strategy uh, for life in, this, in, in the coming weeks, coming months, coming year. Uh, how are we actually going to do mission and how are we going to connect people to God? Because what we'd like to do is we'd start like, to filling these seats and adding more seats, right? We want to start rebuilding Life Bridge again. And, and so I want you to be thinking and praying that through and seeing how God leads and directs you. And, but won't we just even pray now? Let's uh, invite God's presence to be experienced here and uh, grow His church. Father, I want to thank you that we get to partner with you that you're even here this morning. Um, that's a little bit hard even for us to grasp, even though we know it's true. But to sense that, that you are here, you are literally right here in this room with us, listening to our hearts, enjoying us being here, enjoying our worship. And Lord, there's stuff you want to communicate to us. And I just pray that you'd open up our ears so that we could hear from you today. That actually the result of being here today, that our lives might be transformed in some way. Um, through what you communicate to us. And so I ask that your spirit would speak. I just ask that you'd grow your church, both strengthening us, but also inviting others here. Draw people to your son, Jesus Christ, and use us to do that. And Father, um, we just continue to pray that, yeah, that you would be glorified in this world. Lord, we do pray for Gordon Anna. He's had a busy time right now with all these teams coming down. I just pray that you give uh, Gordon Anna both energy and... Um, and especially as we look forward to coming back uh, this, this fall for some time. And so, Father, uh, bless their ministry. Bless Manos' ministry, Compassion's ministry. Build your church there, too. And so, Father, we just want to see your will done here. And uh, so thanks for this time to get together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a little video for you to watch, and then Lindsay's going to come and share a bit of an update. Well, as it turns out, that uh, one outlet over there uh, doesn't have power going to it. And so the computer died, <laughs> ran out of battery, and uh, so, but we got all that fixed thankfully. Um, we're going to start a series today. It's a, a four-week series, basically about uh, community. How can we overcome some of the barriers to community? The, the reality is we all want community. We really do. We, we want friends. We really want to be known. I mean, if you really come right down to it, we want to be known and, and to be truly known and accepted for who we are. We really just want to be able to approach life with the freedom of not putting up a front or uh, putting up a mask or, or being careful of what you say or don't say um, to guard the relationships. We just want to be free because that can be fairly stressful. And, and we approach relationships very fearfully, but the bottom line is we all just want to be loved. We want to be respected. We want to be appreciated. And we just want to be part of a community where we feel that can happen without the fear of that being threatened in some way. And, 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 and so 
that's what we want, but what we want to deal with is what's keeping that from happening in our lives? What's keeping authentic relationship and safe relationship from happening? And what are some of the things that we can do about that? Because to some degree, each of us feels lonely. Now, that's not saying you don't have great relationships, you don't have great marriage, you don't have uh, the community, but at some point, at some level in your soul, there, there's a loneliness that can creep into place and you just, and, 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 and you just long for that to be, to be healed. And, and so that's what we want, but none of us feels relationally safe. Because at some point in the past, each of us have had relationships that have wounded us, that have hurt us. Now, that could be from your family. It could be even from your parents. It could be from siblings. It could be friends. It could be teachers. It could be anyone in the past where suddenly they didn't speak affirmation to you. They didn't speak value to you. They didn't value and treasure you. And, and suddenly that you were robbed of that, and it, 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 it hurt, and it, it, it made you feel isolated and alone, and, and that just didn't feel good. And so as a result, we've got these defenses that have come up in place to protect us from being hurt again. But that fear now in us, can either, it can either drive us to isolation. Sort of, uh, have you ever just wished you could just go off and live in a cabin but in the woods all by yourself? Right? No people around. Or what it's going to do, it's going to drive you to constantly want people around and you can never be by yourself. And, and, and that might be if you find you're one of those people that constantly has the TV on in the background. Um, or or that, that you, you find alone time very stressful. That you constantly need to be with people to feel okay. So it can do one of those two extremes. Isolation or just like obsessively people focused in that sense. And, and, but the problem is no matter what happens that feeling of aloneness is still there. And isn't it kind of interesting that sometimes you most feel aloneness when you're in a room with other people, when you're in a crowded space? Because sometimes that can even make it worse because I'm with all these people and none of them know me, none of them appreciate me, none of them value me, none of them. And, and so then you, you see relationship happening around you and you think that you're missing out on that type of relationship somehow, not being aware that Everyone feels that to some degree. But we have this tension going on in our lives. And, and even despite um, increased social media connection, there's still an isolation that we can feel in our souls. And that's what we want to be tackling over these, these four weeks, saying, is there something we can do about that? Does that have to be the case? And, and, and even if you're not feeling it intentionally now, I can guarantee you, as you look around at the people you see around you or that you know, there's some people that are struggling relationally, that are feeling isolated relationally, that um, just aren't having that love and acceptance and respect experienced in their life. Even though it could be there, they're not experiencing it. And sometimes what happens is we can start to see others as the reasons for our loneliness. We can actually start to blame what we're feeling in our soul on, on, on other people, that there is no one that really cares about me. There, there's no one that's interested in getting to know the real me. Um, I don't matter to people. The church isn't friendly. Uh, and sometimes you just want to yell out to people, stop being self-focused and focus on me. <laughs> sometimes we feel that way, right? But, but sometimes what we can do is we start saying, here's the role that other people aren't playing as to why I'm feeling the way that I feel. And we shift that weight of responsibility onto them. And, and if they're not going to change, well, then I'm stuck here. Do you see a flaw in that thinking? If other people don't change, if other people don't accept me, if other people don't love me, then I am stuck. Now your whole life and your joy and your contentment is rooted in the control of someone else. And if they never do anything about it, you are permanently stuck in that loneliness for the rest of your life. Does that sound like a good option? And when you think about it in those terms, does it actually make sense that your whole sense of identity, worth, and value, love, and respect would be entrusted to other people? And how do we break free of that? Um, because, you know, what happens is when we have that perspective, 
if someone even slights us in, in the slightest way, uh, it simply affirms our beliefs and embeds them even further. And it, it, it diminishes our worth, it diminishes our value, and it does, again, make us either want to hide back or, or, or control and manipulate relationships. And, and, and none of that works really too well. It, it doesn't fix the problem in our soul. And, and this is one of the challenges. And, and so we come up with all these excuses as to why we uh, feel alone and, and unappreciated. But here's the hard truth. We are our own worst enemy. We are the barrier to what we long for. And as long as we put the reasons out there on other people or other circumstances as to why we don't feel fulfilled and content, then that we just prison ourselves, imprison ourselves, and, and, and it takes the, the sense of responsibility off our shoulders, but what it does, it means we can never change. But if we can get to the realization that actually, I'm the only one that can change this. That actually, it isn't resting in other people to make me feel this way. It's actually something going on in me that I need to address and I need to confront if I'm to experience authentic community. Um, I get to tattle on our community group here a little bit. This is one of the downsides of having a pastor in a community group. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we as a community group, we're just discussing this whole uh, concept of uh, what do we need to do to have more authentic community in our group. And, and so we're, we're saying, well, you know, we need to be connecting. We need to be building relationships and getting to know each other. Well, how do we get to know each other? Well, we need to do things together. We need to spend time together. But we also, we need to hear each other's stories. So, and, and we need to eat together. So we decided as a community group, we're going to eat together. But how often should we eat together? Well, once a month. Once a, and saying, guys, like, if, if we're going to build community like family, then let's be like a family. Let's eat together weekly. And so we eventually decide, okay, let's, let's try the eating together weekly sort of thing and see how that goes. And then we said, well, we should need to hear each other's stories as well. And so we thought, okay, well, well let's, uh, let's get some stories uh, out there. We'll, every week we'll have someone share for about 20 minutes uh, sort of their story and, and the critical life transformational moments of their story. And so what we did was we sent out a sign-up list with a schedule of all the dates and, and people could write down when they're going to sell their story. Guess where everyone signed up? At the bottom. And I'm like, <laughs> and, 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 and it's all of us, right? That's what we all do. We say we want community. We want to be known. We want people to know us. And, and we, we want to be able to share a story. And, and, and then when you're given the opportunity, what do we do? Because we have these defense mechanisms that say, no, I am not going to take initiative and and responsibility. I'm just going to keep pulling back. Hopefully other people will do it for me. So what we did is we ripped up that sort of schedule and said, no, no, we're changing this. Names at the top. <laughs> and so we started. And, but you know what's been great? It's been phenomenal being in our group and just hearing people share their stories. And I missed a couple of weeks. Julie missed five weeks, which is traumatic because it is so meaningful hearing uh, the person's stories and what they went through. And we're hearing stuff that we never heard before. We never would have known um, had, unless we had that moment to sit and listen to their story. And then what we do is once they're done their story, we have them sit in a chair in the middle and we all pray for them. Right? We lay hands on them. We just pray for them. Because in part of the sharing story is what can we be praying for you moving forward? And we all pray for them. And um, it, it's, it's a meaningful experience. And, and I, I think that's a really key thing that we're going to, encourage all the groups to be doing this because it is, is such a meaningful time. And, and, and we're encouraging people to be open and vulnerable about some of the stuff that they experience in their life that they've never told anyone. And some of them are doing that. And, and what it's been doing, it's been a real freeing experience because they say, I've never told someone that. Wow, that's a weight off my shoulder now that I've been able to express what happened to me when I was a child or as a teenager, whatever. That, like, uh, that's been a secret all these years. And yet they, 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 they said, I'm going to share it in this group. Is this group a safe group? No, our group's not a safe group because it's a bunch of weird people. But, the, the, but they're saying, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to share what's going on in my life. And, and that was just a healing process, too, to be able to do that. And so one of the things that happens, though, is, is we're all like that. We, when it comes to our moment of being vulnerable and open, we want to sign up at the bottom. 
Because there's a fear and an insecurity in us that says, not me. I don't want to be front and center. I don't want to be exposed. I don't want to be vulnerable. And yet, so do you see what's happening? Is we become our worst enemy. We are actually preventing ourselves from experiencing the type of community of being known and knowing others that we say we want, but we, we find these barriers to push people away constantly in our lives. And that, that's just an example of what we all do in some ways. If, if you have the feeling, nobody knows me, why exactly is that? Chances are, it's because you have created a barrier so that they can't get to know you. You've kept people at a little bit relational distance. You've prevented it from happening because there's a fear and there's an insecurity in your life. Or you haven't invested in relationships long enough and consistently enough where you get to share life experiences that way. Or maybe you haven't been interested enough to hear their story so that they'll want to hear your story. But what happens is we create these barriers that prevent us from experiencing the very thing we desperately long for. If we don't have community, it's because we have not created community. If I don't have community, it's simply because I have not built community into my life. I haven't invested in the lives of others to have that community be there. And so our, in, our insecurities, they, they cause us not to be, one, to be open and vulnerable. Um, we don't want people to see our weakness and to know our needs. We don't want to accept help and assistance from others. We, we aren't consistent in the relationships that we do have. And we only invest in others if they seem to reciprocate back to us in some ways. And, and sometimes those relationships just don't seem to last then, do they? They just come and they fade away, or, or there's only one or two that stick around. But there's reasons for that. See, why do relationships break up if everyone wants relationship? Why does that happen? If everybody truly, at the deeper part of their souls, wants relationship, then why do relationships break up? It's only because we bring fears and insecurities into the relationship that say you must meet certain expectations in order for me to feel safe with you. And if you don't meet my expectations, then I don't feel safe with you. And therefore, I must put a barrier up between me and you so that I guard my own relational safety. But we isolate ourselves. In a process of protecting ourselves from being hurt from someone else, we actually isolate ourselves from community. Because... What relationship is actually really safe? Is anybody really safe all the time? No. So, Scripture says this, though. In Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12, it says, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone <laughs> is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. How can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. You know what? Everything that we just read there, we affirm is true. None of us would deny any of that. But when it comes to our personal lives, are we really willing to embrace this in our lives and, and, and seek it out and build it into our lives? As far as what authentic community would look like, authentic community means that you are able to enter into that community of people with anyone and be open and honest about who you are. Uh, not self-obsessed, not like you dominate the conversation, letting everyone know the dark de de details of your life, but that there's not a fear controlling your life that says, oh, I can't let people know this about me because if they know this about me, they won't like me. No, it just means I, you can be open or almost saying, you know, I I'm struggling with this. You know, life over here is great, but yeah, there's a few things here I'm struggling with. And, and, and it's just being you. It's just being natural. It's just being yourself. Uh, authentic community says that, that uh, you are sincerely interested in the well-being of others. See, where I can dis, uh, make community dysfunctional is when I enter into a community just for what it gives me. That's partly where we say about our community groups. Guys, when you go to a community group, it's not about you. 
Go to a community group for how you can be there for others, how you can invest in others, how you can build up others. Make others your focus in that community group. Build up others. Now, the neat thing is, if they're all doing that, you're going to have a whole whack of people doing the same to you. So it, if you can just go and say, here are some people, I'm going to care about them. I'm going to show up for them. I'm going to speak up uh, uh, in, in the study discussions because it'll help all of us together grow. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to do whatever for them. It doesn't matter about me. And if, if you're building up them, then they are being built up. Now, if everyone in the group catches that vision and everyone is then you know, building each other up, can you imagine what that group's going to be? If everyone's praying for each other, if everyone's encouraging each other, if everyone's speaking truth and gospel truth to each other, that's going to be cool. And, and then um, in community, it also means that, that I'm willing um, and excited to receive help from others. I'm actually open to people speaking truth into my life. So if I'm struggling, they can make me stronger. This, this idea of the, um, like three cords together, twisted together, is stronger than one cord. Well, if, if, if we're united together and, and they're coming alongside me, and if they're going to be strong and speak truth into my life where I'm weak, then, then together we're so much stronger and, and it can't be broken. And, and so what that means is I want to come into, to your, into your life and, and be wrapped up in your life in a sense. You wrapped up in my life because then we're stronger. But if I'm, if, if I'm not wrapped up in the lives of people in community, then I'm alone and I'm very weak and I can be broken. But in that community, then others get to speak into my life. They get to encourage. They get to rebuke me. They get to help me. And, and when others fail or when I fail, instead of condemnation and judgment, we understand we're all broken. There's quickness to forgive. There's grace. We build each other up. We say, hey, yeah, you did blow it there. No, too bad. Let's not do that again. Let's, how, how can we help you move forward? Right? So community says it, it's not judgment, but it's acceptance. And it's not being critical. But it's looking at people saying, man, how can I support? How can I build you up? How can I encourage you? Yeah, I see you're struggling. Yeah, I, you made a stupid decision over there. Own up to it, but let's move forward together. So that's what authentic community is. Authentic community is where you laugh lots. Don't take things too seriously. Um, laughter and love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't say that in the Bible, laughter covering a multitude of sins. But, but, but it does when you, when you have love and there's laughter, you can laugh off the little stuff and you're not so easily offended. You don't get offended quickly in those types of scenarios. But ultimately, there's relational safety in community, not because people are safe, because people are not safe. Nobody's safe. You are not safe. Do you understand that? You are not a relationally safe person because at some point in time, you're going to let someone else in. You will not meet everyone's expectations all the time. You will not be safe to everyone. Um, and so relational safety is not because people are safe, but because Jesus is present in your community and, and Jesus is safe. And this is the key. You will never be relationally safe unless Jesus is your relational safety. If you, unless you understand that he loves you, he accepts you, he forgives you, he gives you his capacity to love others, and he reconciles you through his spirit with himself, but he'll also reconcile you in the community that you're in when you fail and when things get broken. Jesus is the ultimate answer to authentic community. Uh, Jesus is the one who can actually rescue you from your aloneness when no one else can. And by the way, no one else can. Your relational void is too deep for any person to fill. And if you start putting that weight on one person to meet your relational needs, man, you're going to smother that person. That relationship cannot survive. You need community. You need more than one or two people. You need community. Jesus had, had three close friends, Peter, James, John. But then he had the community of the 12. And then he had the larger community of friends, family, and disciples. Je Jesus had broad community at different levels of intensity. You need community. And if you just have um, just one person in your life, I feel sorry for that one person because they're going to feel smothered in that relationship. And, and they're going to feel the weight, the burden of trying to make you feel special. But listen to what Jesus does. Jesus invites us into his family to know him, to be known by him, and to be 
to know his family and be known by his family. Listen to what it says in Ephesians 1.5. God predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Sometimes people that grow up being adopted can struggle with feelings of insecurity and relational safety because there can be sometimes a perception that they were abandoned as a child by their birth parents. That there was a rejection. Now, that probably wasn't true in any capacity, but, but there's that emotional feeling of not being loved by the birth mother and father that can create feelings of insecurity and inadequacy. And sometimes that can blind them to the fact that they've been chosen. They've been adopted. Instead of an accidental birth into a family, that, that actually a family's come along and looked at them and saw them and said, I want that child. I want relationship. And I want them in my family. I want to love them as my own. What a tremendous message that is. What a tremendous voice that is. That say they long desperately for you to be in their family. And this is what God is saying is, I long desperately for you to be in my family, to be known by me and to know me. And, and I love it because he says, in accordance with his pleasure and will. In other words, when you're in God's family, it just delights him. It brings pleasure to him. He's excited by you. He's excited by you. He takes pleasure in you. And he invites you into the relational oneness of the Godhead itself. And so it goes on, John 1, 12. But to all believed in him, Jesus, and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus is there saying, yes, I give you the right. It's a privilege. I give you the privilege, the, the authority, the ability to enter into God's family. He says, you get to be a part of his family. And you've got to understand that in his family, he cares and he provides and he protects. And he's there with you. This is an incredible thing to be a part of the family of God. Don't underestimate that. And so it says in 1 John 3, 1, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Man, do you sort of underestimate that at times? Do you underestimate what it means to truly be loved uh, by the Father to the same degree that Jesus is loved by the Father? And do you understand it's the same? As much as the Father loves his son Jesus, the Father loves you if you are his child in his family. It's the same love because God's love is always a full, complete love. It's not a lesser love than he has for Jesus. It's the same love he has for Jesus. And, and this is sort of a mind-boggling thing. And then Hebrews 13.5, it's God has said, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Why? Because I love you as much as I love, my, I love Jesus. Right? It, it, it's a little bit mind-boggling for us. So if we're to overcome... Um, these barriers that we've established in our lives to community, I, I think the first thing you got to do, this is probably all we'll get to today, you've got to reaffirm your identity as a child of God. Isn't it interesting how the Lord's Prayer starts? Our Father. Why? Why is that such a key start to the prayer that Jesus told the disciples to pray? Because only when you understand that, that God is Father, that will it, it, it start to change our understanding of relational safety. You know, kids that grow up in a dysfunctional family um, always have a distorted sense of their identity and their role in community. And that's true of all of us to some degree, right? We've all grown up in dysfunctional families because no, everybody's dysfunctional. <laughs> Sin has distorted all of us. But to varying degrees, that dysfunction can be uh, more intense. And if we've grown up specifically where, uh, where their, our parents were in a dysfunctional relationship, that really created a lack of sense of safety. If our parents divorced, if uh, those types of dynamics are at play, that really creates a sense of lack of safety, lack of security, and a questioning sense of value. And so the only way to break a dysfunctional perspective is to understand... Um, 
that God sees you. He sees you as you really are. In other words, right now, the Spirit of God is in this room. We mentioned that in the prayer earlier. God, you are here. You see us. In other words, you're standing exposed before God right now. He sees everything in your life. He sees all your distorted perspectives. He sees all your sinful addictions. He sees all the ways you've wounded people before. He sees all your fears and insecurities that push him and others away. He sees it all. And he says, I accept you. I accept you. I love you fully for who I made you to be. He says, yeah, you're, you've been messing up your lives. You bought into a, a lot of lies and distorted things, but I know who I made you to be, and I love you. And I love you not because of how you've measured up or how you've lived. I simply love you because that's who I am. I love. And I can't stop loving you. I see everything about you, and I accept you as you are with all your faults, all your failures, everything. I, I see it, and I accept you. You see, that is the key to relational safety. He knows everything about you, but he still longs to adopt you into his intimate community, into his intimate family. And you will only ever find when relational safety in your life, when you um, understand that you, you are fully exposed and yet still accepted. Isn't it interesting that at the end of time, when we stand before the judgment, it says everything will be disclosed. Nothing will be kept hidden. <laughs> You're standing naked before God <laughs> and everyone else in a sense. And yet, at that time, he still affirms his acceptance of you. He's clearing away all the hidden garbage, what stuff you think is hidden, He's exposing it all so that you can become relationally safe. It's only when you stand exposed and are fully accepted that you can be relationally safe, isn't it? Um, so sometimes people have struggled with this in their own life. They've really diminished their worth and their value because of value statements of others in their past. And so one of the things that I would sometimes say is saying, here's what I want you to do. Sometime this week when no one else is in the house, I want you to go and stand naked in front of a mirror. And just look at yourself. And you know, see all the things that you think are faults and blemishes. And are you overweight, too skinny, crooked nose, whatever it is, just see it all. And understands that God sees it all. And he loves and accepts you. And he says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. So I tell people to stand in front of a mirror and simply say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God loves me. I'm fully accepted by him. And that's all that matters. You know how many people can't do that? They liter literally cannot do it. They'll come back the next week saying, how'd it go? Couldn't do it. We'd keep working on it, saying, what are the lies? What are the lies? What's, what's God's truth? To get to the point where they can do it and just be free to be exposed and accepted by God. Because as long as you have fear of acceptance that you need to keep stuff hidden and, and covered up as a basis for acceptance, then you will never be relationally safe and it'll affect all your relationships. So what God says is, I want you to understand, you are exposed and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I accept you right now where you're at. And I am your relational safety. So, if you cannot um, find relational safety with God who knows your every fault and yet st still chose to die for you and love you and accept you in this family, then you need to understand you will never be willing to engage in authentic community. You never will. If you've got that many fears in with God and you can't trust his acceptance, you will never trust anyone's acceptance. And you will always be guarded. You'll always be defensive. You'll always push people out to here. And no one will ever get to know you. And then you'll stand back saying, nobody knows me. Because we are too fearful to let people know us. And so God says, I want to change that. I want you to find your identity and your safety and security in me. And um, you know what? Then if you can understand that your identity is Christ, 
then you don't have to actually fear your identity being determined by other people. You don't actually have to worry about what other people think of you. You don't have to be worried whether they're going to accept you or not because your identity and your relational safety is already resting in Christ who is unconditional acceptance. You don't have to measure up to anyone at all. And so if your identity is there, you don't have to fear their opinions. Then when others don't accept you, you don't have to withdraw and say, oh, I've got to avoid them. Have you ever done that? Been in a room with someone and made sure you stayed on the other side of the room because you didn't want to have to see someone? Ever see someone in a grocery store and quickly walk down a different aisle? Because you don't have relational safety because in some ways you're still longing for acceptance from that person. They're not giving it to you, so you must avoid them. Like, have you ever been in that type of bondage? <laughs> yes, you have. But when Christ is there, you don't have to impress you don't have to keep things at a surface level because there is absolutely nothing to risk. This idea of community groups being a safe place, I think, that's a ridiculous thought. It's never a safe place. Why do you need it to be a safe place? What, community groups should be confidential? Yeah, we affirm that, but why? Why do you need it to be confidential? Who cares if everyone knows all the dark and deep details of your life? Does that change your acceptance and your worth and your value? That's why it's kind of cool in these stories where people are starting to share some of the stuff that they thought people might not accept them if they knew, and that yet they share it, and has the group accepted them less? No, we respect them more because they are courageous and open and vulnerable. You see, you see the kingdom of God takes our fears and, and upends them, and it sets us free. You know, I'm out of time. I could talk on this topic forever. But, you know, when you are relationally safe in Christ, your relational safety is dependent on the consistent love of God as opposed to the love of others. If your relational safety is dependent on others being consistently safe, then you will actually never, ever, ever create authentic community. You will not create authentic community. You will actually be a barrier to authentic community because you won't even let others get to know you. So they can't engage with you. You won't let them engage... Uh, you won't let them engage with us, so you can't engage with them fully because there's, we actually become the stumbling block to authentic community just because we are looking for safety from others. And so the answer, the first answer to, to authentic community is we really got to grapple with the fact that who am I turning to for my safety? Will other people ever give me safety? No. So does that mean I can never be safe? No, actually. You can actually be incredibly safe even when others are not safe because your safety doesn't rest in their confidentiality. It doesn't rest in their respect. It doesn't rest in their acceptance. Your relational safety rests in a God who loves you and has invited you into his holy Godhead and into his family, and it is secure for the rest of eternity. You are fully known. And if no one else ever knows you, that's fine. Because you know someone knows you. And someone fills that void. And it's only in Jesus Christ. Then, when that happens, I'm free to engage people without fear. I'm free to be open and honest, because who cares? I'm free not to be controlled by what they think. And I'm, I'm actually free now to invest with others without getting anything in return. Without them meeting my expectations. I've done all this. I've had people over for dinner and no one's ever had me over for dinner. That's fine. Who cares? You're relationally safe. Invest in them. Build them up. Allow, allow Christ to work through you in their lives. Start working on community. And so this week, I just want to encourage you to be starting to think through. Am I pulling back? Are there things I need to change? If so, maybe you want to write that on your connection card. You know, I need to... I need to be more proactive in this, or I need to make this change. I need to, I need to do this to build community. I need to stop doing this. I need to stop withdrawing. Or you can write that down. We'll email it back to you. If there's a prayer request saying, you know what, this is something I'm struggling with. Would you give me the courage and the, the perspective, God, to help me find my relational safety in you? We'll pray for you. Put that as a prayer request. And whatever it is, put that on your connection card, and we'll be praying for you. But, um, well, uh, I pray for you now, and then once we sing our last song, if you want prayer right now for something, we have some people at the back that will pray for you as we sing our last song. But let's just pray. Father, 
I'm not a relationally safe person. Um, and uh, uh, Lord, Father, I, I, I keep you at distance because I'm fearful at times. But Lord, I just pray for each of us here that you would help us to trust your love for us. <laughs> your unconditional, unquestioning, full acceptance. Help us understand that you see us fully, but you accept us fully. And that our relational safety will never come from other people. It comes only from you. And so, Father, in areas where we've been um, protecting ourselves from other people, help us tear down those defensive walls because as we trust you, we don't need those defensive walls anymore. We can just be free to love people and let people see us for who we are. We don't need to have masks or pretenses up. Lord, just help us to be uh, who you created us to be. And as a result, then help us do what you created us to do in loving others and representing your love to others. So, Father, thanks that we can find relational safety in you. Help us to do that this week in practical ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand again. Let's stand, and I encourage you to make this declaration about no longer being a slave to fear, your own declaration. You unravel me with a